am standing here with AIDS up front line today, joined by Dr. Vince Kaleo, and we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, the crashing tox patient. In fact, this is going to be a great follow-up for last week's podcast with Dr. Cantor. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, go back and listen, uh, because of his five cases are uh, pretty fantastic, you know, it, over the years, the things he's seen, and some of that common stuff. But today, we're also doing something special. This is going to be our first episode that you have the opportunity to see and hear. So if you're on your traditional player, you can hear us just fine and everything's going to be the same. But we're going to take this podcast, the video aspect of the record with including the um, some of the slides with it and have it up on our YouTube channel. So if you want to take the opportunity and see some of these things that we're talking about, then uh, feel free to jump on over there at some point to our YouTube channel and take a gander at that. We hope you do that a little bit more. You get to see how nice Dr. Kaleo dressed up today after his TV interview and what I dress like, which is nothing close to that uh, as I'm sitting here in a hotel in Baltimore, Baltimore Maryland. Um, so I appreciate it and appreciate him being willing to uh, jump in on this experiment as well. So Dr. Kaleo, give us a little background on yourself and uh, let's roll from there. Awesome. All right, well, thanks, Ryan and uh, Melissa. Thank you both for letting me uh, come on the show and talk to everybody today. So I, uh, like uh, Ryan said, my name is Vince Kaleo. I am currently the medical director of the Upstate New York Poison Center. And uh, I took over from uh, Dr. Mike Hodgman and prior to him, Dr. Kanner, who was on with uh, with Ryan just a little while ago. So big shoes to fill there. And uh, I did my training in emergency medicine at SUNY Upstate and then stuck around here to do my pediatric emergency medicine fellowship and subsequently my medical toxicology fellowship from there. Uh, I finished back in 2021 from the MedTox fellowship and I uh, took over for Dr. Hodgman as the medical director for the Poison Center here at that point in time. And right now I kind of split my time between the uh, the Poison Center, toxicology consult service and emergency medicine. So I uh, like to try to stay busy in those ways, keeps me out of trouble. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you. So we're going to try to, at least at some point during your discussion, as you talk about a case, uh, do what Cantor said and said, we need to, and the, the folks in his emergency department said, we, do we need to call the, uh, the poison center? He says, that's me. So here's what we're going to do. And so uh, we have that same level of expertise in terms of, um, in terms of our guest today and, and look forward to it. So let's dive right in. So we're talking about the crashing tox patient today. And what I really love, especially perusing through some of this, is you really do start off with, you know, where most of us are, which is the, um, which is in the community setting, which is where the majority of our physicians are going to be working, and where many, if not the majority of these patients are going to uh, show up. And uh, we'll see that here. So let's start off with uh, case one, our little community based hospital with our 15 uh, year old that uh, got into the aspirin a few hours ago. Yeah, you know, I think that's great, Ryan. I'm just going to uh, hop forward with the slides. We've got them in front of us. And for those following virtually, they'll be able to kind of keep up with it there. Moment there. And here we go. All right. So for the first case, uh, yeah, so uh, you know, use a, uh, a local emergency medicine provider at a small outside hospital. You're having a really nice morning. It's weekend. Things are going great. So just to paint the scene. And the next uh, next person that pops on the board is the 15-year-old female who comes in after reportedly ingesting about 100 tablets of aspirin. Now, you don't really know a lot more about the aspirin at that point in time in terms of you know, what the formulation is or what the strength is, but 100 tablets is a lot of medication regardless. You get a little bit more history from the kiddo, and you find that the ingestion occurred about four hours ago. And so with that being uh, in the back of your mind, you walk into the room and what do you see? Taking a look, you find the child does have some changes in vital signs compared to what you'd like. You find that she's breathing at about 28 breaths per minute, but she's not just breathing quickly. You notice that she's breathing deeply. So you have that tachypnea in addition to that hypopnea. And I think that's one thing I really want everyone who's listening today to really make sure you walk away with this. Uh, remembering is that usually with salicylate poisonings, you certainly do see a uh, pretty significant uh, tachypnea, but that's not always going to be the case. There are some cases where the respiratory rate may be 18, and if you only look at the vital signs, you can kind of get fooled because these patients oftentimes are really heaving and having marked uh, hyperpnea that may not always be reflected. But in this case here, you do see both the tachypnea and the hyperpnea on her exam. And her heart rate's a little bit high too. 
She's laying in the bed. She's, you know, a little bit confused, but not horribly agitated. And she's resting about 1.30. So that tells me there's probably something going on we don't really like. In terms of her other vital signs, there's nothing that's really jumping out as egregiously abnormal. So when you're looking at her overall, she does appear to be maybe a little bit confused, isn't really interacting quite the way you'd expect an otherwise healthy 15-year-old to interact, but you don't notice any signs of focal deficits or any marked agitation or confusion. Looking at her pupils, her HENT exam, uh, her airway, everything looks like that's relatively normal. But again, when you go to listen to the heart, you listen to the lungs, you find that she is to or uh, tachypnic, hyperpnic, and tachycardic. So kind of like a trifecta for badness right there. Going a little bit further, you take a quick look at her abdomen. Can't really get the best exam because she's kind of moving around and is a little bit altered. And you notice that she is a little bit confused when you're looking at the neuro and MSK. Otherwise, again, normal strength appears to be relatively normal sensation. And when you look at her skin, she's got warm skin, but you notice that she's a little bit diaphoretic. So that's the picture that we have in front of us right now. And then the question becomes, well, what do you do? And when I start to think about things from my standpoint, I kind of go back to the, uh, the very basics that you learned at the earliest stages of your training and residency. Go back to your primary survey and hit those A, B, C, D, E's. There are some things that are different between the overall workup of a general non-differentiated patient in the ED compared to one that you know is toxicologic in nature. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that right now, and then I'll turn it back over to Ryan for just a minute. So overall with the airway, the breathing, the circulation, these ones are gonna be relatively similar to every patient you're going to see. In this case, she's talking to you though she's confused. So that airway is patent looking pretty good. From a breath sound standpoint, she doesn't have any horrible signs of you know decreased lung sounds to make you think she's got some other marked abnormality there, but you do you do notice that increased worker breathing. From a circulation standpoint, it's intact. And remember, when we're thinking about our normal primary survey, D and E usually stand for disability and exposure. I want you to think about those for the peds tox patient, but in addition to that, I want you to remember a couple other things. The first one is D also stands for dextro stick or finger stick, check the sugar, because in this case, you find that the blood sugar is 90. Now, without getting into too much of the nitty gritty science behind it, you probably remember that with uh, salicylate poisonings, there's that weird concept called neuroglycopenia, or if you're looking for a really cool word to drop amongst the Scrabble crowd, um, hypoglycorrhachia. Uh, don't ask me how to spell it, I don't really know. But, uh, but either way, so you've got a blood sugar of 90 and you're thinking, hey, this patient may be an aspirin poisoning. So what do we need to think about? Well, in general, the uh, CSF glucose may be about one third of what the serum glucose is in certain cases with salicylate toxicity. So when I see a blood sugar of 90 peripherally and an altered patient from a salicylate poisoning, I'm thinking, boy, there's that potential that CSF glucose may actually be maybe kind of like 30. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to give a, a dextrose bolus just to try to correct something that's easy and fixable. If the worst thing that happens is you're giving her roughly half of like a candy bar's equivalent worth of glucose, I think you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. So you give her the dextrose bolus, really doesn't do all that much. And when we're thinking about the E, uh, again, exposure is super important for a tox patient. You want to make sure they don't have any signs of any patches, any burns on their skin, um, or anything that could maybe change some absorption or, or whatnot. But it's really, really important to remember that EKG. There are some things from the toxicologic world that can really change a number of different things on that EKG, right? So you can have things that alter the overall cardiac conduction. You can cause QRS prolongation, QT prolongation. It, it all depends on the toxin. So when in doubt for a tox patient, always get that EKG, and it's definitely going to help you. It's a really cheap, quick uh, test that you can perform at the bedside, and it maybe can give you a lot of information that can really alter the overall treatment and the, uh, the care for the patient. So in this case, you get the EKG, and fortunately, you notice everything is looking really good. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at right now, Ryan. Well, the good news is if you're throwing the word hyperglycorrhachia into your uh, Scrabble, unless somebody's looking it up, they're not going to know how to spell it either. And you may not have a board big enough for that word. Um, if you are keeping score, though, and not associated with Scrabble, um, this is the second podcast, uh, with the last one being Dr. Cantor, that we the D and the ABCDE uh, is dextrostick. 
you know, an important thing that we need to keep in mind with our, especially our pediatric patients, but actually all patients who come in uh, with alteration in mental status. Uh, I mean, it is part of the stroke protocols uh, for most places is, you know, it is what is the dextra stick and making sure that that is in there as well. Now, where you're going to get to in a minute, and I'll talk to it afterwards, is on the flashback I'm going to have associated with the acid base disturbance with the salicylate toxicity with an experience I had in medical school uh, before heading into emergency medicine residency. So let's dive into that uh, because we're talking, to, you're already talking about the tachypnea and the deep breathing um, and, and those types of things. So let's dive a bit into the acid base disturbance and the expectations we're going to see of the salicylate toxicity. Awesome. All right. Yeah, we'll hop right into it. And uh, just as a, as a fun side note, um, if uh, yeah, you heard uh, D stands for dextra stick for the second time in a row, it's, uh, it's no surprise considering who, uh, who one of my training, <laughs> my mentors and uh, prior attendings was. So, all right. So yeah, so when we start to think about salicylates and the way they work, I'm sure all of you probably remember from your days of emergency medicine residency or other training, as toxicologists, sometimes we do like to get into the nitty gritty details, but I think as a bedside practicing emergency medicine clinician, there are some really core things that you have to remember because this could be the difference between helping a patient to live or uh, and survive and have a good outcome, or maybe having a, a somewhat more adverse one. So when we start to think about the overall acid-based disturbances that we see with salicylates, it really comes from a few different factors. Early on when salicylates are in your system, what they do is they like to get into that respiratory center of your brain and cause some stimulation. So essentially what that's doing is even before the salicylates are poisoning your cells and causing problems from the cellular level that we'll get to in just a minute, it's really telling your brain to breathe more quickly and oftentimes more deeply. And so normally in that very early stage of salicylate poisoning, what you're going to see is a respiratory alkalosis. Now, depending on how much was taken and a whole bunch of other factors, once the salicylates in your system, you then start to see some other stuff. And that includes things like uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. So effectively, you become an anaerobe. It's generally frowned upon in plate society, so try to steer clear of it if you're able. But otherwise, this is what really leads to some of those really complicated acid-base pictures that we see on a pretty regular basis with a sick salicylate patient. So what are we going to expect? Well, like we said before, Early on, that respiratory alkalosis is going to be the most common thing seen quickly and relatively soon after a salicylate toxicity uh, you know, presents to your hospital. Now, one thing I do want to remind people of is that for pediatric patients, things may be a little bit different. Kids from an anatomic and physiologic perspective are different than adults. And just based on that, sometimes you don't always catch that respiratory alkalosis a lot of this has to do with the way that the pediatric anatomy is and the way that the physiology is. Kids may tire a little bit more quickly, and you may not see that respiratory alkalosis by the time they present to you, depending on the individual case. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But once you get past that respiratory alkalosis step, or step the next thing that you see is more of that mixed picture, and it's going to be a metabolic acidosis caused by the aspirin poisoning your cells that's going to be uh, you know, kind of playing like a tug of war with your acid base status with the respiratory alkalosis. Now that your body's, you know, your body was already breathing quickly to begin with because of the stimulation of the respiratory center. But now in addition to that, it's also kind of fighting to try to keep a relatively normal physiologic pH. So as you're developing that metabolic acidosis, there's also that attempt at a compensatory mechanism from a respiratory standpoint as well. Now, unfortunately, as we know, um, you can only exercise uh, for so long before you get tired. And the same thing holds true when you're breathing quickly from salicylate poisoning. I mean, I walked up two flights of stairs to the PZD the other day and I was getting fatigued. So I can only imagine how some of these, uh, you know, these patients are when they're breathing really rapidly for a long period of time. And once you start to tire out, that's when you get that metabolic and respiratory acidosis. And that's really bad news. That's usually when people start to get very precipitously ill and start to circle the dream. So it's really important to be very cognizant when you're taking care of a salicylate poison patient to really watch for those acid-based disturbances and know where you're at because it can help you to risk stratify you know, where the patient is in their illness, how sick they may get, and what interventions you need to perform. You mentioned some of the physical exam aspect of things, of course, now go up, heading into the acid-based disturbance. You know, this is, to me, I was on an away rotation um, for emergency medicine. So I thought I wanted to do emergency medicine as a fourth year medical student. 
And uh, there had been a trauma patient had come in and they asked if I wanted to do the intubation and did the intubation. I was super excited, stoked about it around the next morning uh, as we were wrapping up that shift. Um, you know, I guess the attending at the time wasn't excited that I was excited about an intubation. So decided to throw at me while we're all standing there in the hallway of the emergency department. What is the structure and timeline of the acid based disturbances associated with the salicylate toxicity? And uh, I felt pretty bad after that. Wasn't very excited. Maybe said a few bad words in my head. Thankfully, my frontal lobe protected uh, for them being public bad words. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's one of those. This is one of those weird uh, toxicities that does kind of go through the full gamut of um, of the acid base process, you know, going from that respiratory alkalosis mixed uh, metabolic and respiratory, and then of course going on to the full on uh, acidosis standpoint. And you mentioned some of the physical exam findings. Let's let's dive into what in this case the evaluation, what you found from a numbers standpoint once we did the lab evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so kind of getting into that. So now that we have gone through with that case, the overall history, physical exam, and talked a little bit about what you see, let's talk about some of the labs. So you go ahead and you get a BMP on this patient. And what you find is that you look at her and you see, hey, she's got a bicarb of 13. That's not a good sign. That's telling me that she's definitely got a pretty substantial metabolic acidosis. It's already kind of playing a role. Now, one thing I do want to point out to everybody um, is that in this case here, her chloride was much more elevated than you'd expect it to be for a sodium of 136. Now, again, for a lot of people, it, it may not always be the case, but one important thing to remember is that at some institutions, salicylates actually cross-react with chloride on some of, the, uh, some of the BMP assays. So if you find that someone's got an unexplained acidosis, you find the chloride's higher than you expect it to be, always keep aspirin on your differential. Because that's certainly something that, you know, maybe a little clue that might help tip you off to something that could potentially save a patient's life. So in this case, uh, her bicarb came back and it was okay. Or I'm sorry, it was pretty low. Uh, the chloride was uh, 117, so a little bit high. And her glucose was actually looking okay. But remember, earlier on in this case, because she was a little altered, you went ahead and you gave her some dextrose too, just to try to get that number up a bit. And looking at a few of her other labs, you get a blood gas at the bedside, you find her pH is 7.31 with a PCO2 of 26. Now, for those of you who don't want to go and do winter's formula, I try to avoid it when I can too. Um, it, it, it's approximately compensated, you know, maybe not perfectly, but at least a, a fair attempt from the body. You get the aspirin level back and it's 67. And that's definitely a pretty elevated level, particularly with the clinical context that we have in front of us. And because you're being a very thorough EM doc, you also get that Tylenol level just to make sure that that's negative because if someone takes one thing, they might also have taken another. And uh, I think it's really important to just make sure that you're, you're checking the Tylenol level or a, uh, acetaminophen level on patients as well, um, particularly if they're a potential self-harm attempt. So that's kind of where we're at here from a lab standpoint, Ryan. And when I'm looking at these numbers here again, I'm seeing that that pH is 7.31 with a PCO2 of 26. And I'm remembering that bicarb was 13. So this is definitely telling me that this patient does have the, uh, the metabolic acidosis component and attempting to compensate with that respiratory alkalosis. So kind of in that, in that second phase right there. Let's dive into, you know, what do we do now? We've got the patient in front of us. We've got this from the community setting. We've got these numbers that are now starting to come across. We've got a, you know, an overall partially uh, attempted compensated uh, acidosis here. Um, and it's likely not going to get better at, on its own right now. You know, we're probably still kind of teetering on that edge of bad things happening or, or wouldn't end up on, on a, in a crashing tox talk. Mm -hmm. um, so let's kind of run into some of those things we need to start running through and doing now. And then, you know, as it's what starts to happen is the um, overdose starts to mature. Yep. All right. So as we're going through, you're, uh, you're kind of kicking in the high gear. You recognize this patient is potentially critically ill. So what are we going to do? Well, first off, you're going to go ahead and you're going to start this patient on a bicarb. Uh, you're going to give a couple bicarb boluses to try to get that pH up a little bit. And then you're going to start the patient on a bicarb infusion. And part of the reason for that is you're trying to both alkalinize the serum as well as the urine. So you're going to try to decrease the amount of uh, aspirin that's getting into the brain. And you're also going to try to trap it in the urine to help with excretion. So that's great. And it works for some patients, but for the ones that are really sick, it may not be enough. 
So you're going to repeat and trend those labs. And in this case here, I'm going to, you know, as soon as that aspirin level comes back for the first one, I want another one down there in the lab cooking already. I want to know where that's going. That 67 might be going up, that 67 might be going down, it might be staying the same. You really have no idea. And even if you have two data points, it's still impossible to really draw a great line of best fit to figure out your overall direction. So you need to repeat and trend labs frequently, including the salicylate, the blood gas, and the BMP. That's really going to help guide your management. In this case here, I'm worried about this kid. She's not looking great from an overall uh, standpoint from a physical exam and a lab one as well. So I'm calling nephrology and getting them on board. Even at large academic institutions, it sometimes can take several hours to get someone on dialysis just based on the overall amount of resources that need to be you know, summoned in. And depending on the time of day, uh, week, day, a whole bunch of other things that can play that role. So Nephrology involvement early on could really be helpful because you can dialyze salicylates off. You're going to monitor really closely, but what do you do when the patient starts to fatigue? And Ryan, I'm really glad that you mentioned that story from what you had as a medical student. And it sounds like it really did, uh, you know, kind of stick in your mind and help you remember salicylates because a sick salicylate patient really does scare us. Even some of the people who practice for 30, 35 years get really nervous with a sick salicylate. Part of the reason is because knowing when to intubate these patients is a really, really tricky thing. We try to avoid intubating salicylate poison patients. And one of the main reasons is because even the, the dumbest body is wiser than the smartest physician. And I say that because your body knows intrinsically if you need to breathe faster, if you need to breathe deeper in order to keep that pH where it needs to be, it's really hard for even the best bedside clinician to know exactly where that patient's at. And so once the, uh, the patient you know, loses the ability to breathe and compensate and adjust on their own because they need to be intubated, it becomes a lot more tricky to know exactly where you're at. So when we look at the literature surrounding salicylate patients, we know that the majority of deaths that occur do tend to occur very frequently in that peri-intubation period. So you want to make sure you're being careful. And now it's not really clear if the deaths are occurring because the patient was going to decompensate anyways, and that's why they were intubating, or if there's something that happened with the intubation that maybe made the patient more acidotic, a lot more uh, salicylate to get into the brain and cause a whole bunch of other problems. So a little bit tough, but intubating these patients is a really scary thing. If you are going to do it, because now that patient is fatiguing and you know that respiratory rate that was 28 is now eight, and you're getting really concerned, you sometimes do have to intubate these people. And if you do, maximize your intubating conditions, really hyperventilate them beforehand. If I need to intubate someone at the bedside that's a salicylate poisoning, I'm giving them a bolus of bicarbonate beforehand. And depending on what you have available to you will kind of dictate your medication choice. If the patient hasn't decompensated and you know completely, but you're kind of teetering and you wanted to try something like ketamine just to you know maybe not take away the respiratory drive um, completely, Okay, but I'll tell you, if you're really comfortable with RSI, with, uh, you know, I, I really like rocuronium personally, if you're comfortable with that and you think that's going to really increase your chances of getting it quickly on the first try, maximize and go with, uh, go with what works for you and what's going to give that patient the best chance of a successful first pass rapid intubation. And then once you get them successfully intubated, ask for help. I'll tell you, I'm not you know, a slouch when it comes to vet management, but I am nowhere as near being as adept as my ICU colleagues or respiratory therapists. I know what I need them to do, which is to breathe very, you know, very differently on, or have the patients breathe differently on the vent than they may routinely do. So I'm going to tell them, I need this patient to have an increased minute ventilation rate and kind of tell them why and let them kind of help to adjust from there. And once they, I kind of have that, I'm repeating those labs frequently. In fact, for me, I like to repeat a blood gas at the bedside maybe every 15 minutes once they're intubated for at least maybe an hour or so to ensure that I've got them at an appropriate rate and they're not decompensating from there. And then maybe if things are looking stable, you can start to spread out a little bit, but that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis depending on where you're at. And, uh, you know, so in this case here, you got the successful intubation, nephrology got there, they dialyzed quickly, and this kiddo actually had a very good outcome despite how sick she was because you recognized all these things early on and were able to treat appropriately. This is uh, a couple of good nuggets there, um, you know, with with the, especially in the community setting. If you're in the community setting, it's just like ATLS talks about. If you find yourself in a place where, you know, the end result, what may have, what may be the worst case need for treatment is not available at your facility, start initiating that transfer 
in that movement as quickly as possible. Because if we're talking about nephrology and getting dialysis involved, especially with a pediatric patient where a lot of facilities will not, um, you know, making that transfer, uh, start to make those things happen in anticipation. And of course, also with the innovation, you know, this is one of those things that if you have a, uh, a, a respiratory therapist who's more uh, attuned and, and more accustomed to adult intubations and has not done any or very few pediatric intubations and in management, you know, if you take away that drive and now all of a sudden we've got them on a rate of 12 to 14, um, you know, we're going to end up making that acid-base balance even worse. And, and so keeping in mind that we'll have to go with those faster rates uh, than, than expected. So keeping on top of that and how we may impact the physiology, how we may impact the acid-base balance. If, you know, if we take that person and, and as you mentioned, Rocky Ronium is one of my favorites as well, um, that you're going to take away their drive to breathe for about 30 minutes. And so you're not going to get that spontaneous internal drive that says, this is what I need. Um, um, so, you know, keep those uh, in mind. Fantastic uh, case with regard to a salicylate toxicity. Um, didn't even, didn't even have to mention the ringing in the ears, none of the tinnitus based stuff. That's, we made it through the entire thing. I try not to be too predictable, but, uh, perfect. And, and, you know, just to, just to piggyback onto that one last comment about the intubation stuff. I, I usually tell people, you know, we always kind of throw about match their, their rate before they were intubated. The thing I just want to remind people is it's not the rate before they were intubated if they're decompensating, right? Match the rate they were at initially before they started to decompensate. And so I, I just wanted to make sure I said that too, because sometimes it's kind of tossed about and someone's like, well, they were breathing at 10 before we intubated them. So let's start them at 10. And that's not what you want to do. You want to match where they were beforehand. So we've, we've taken care of this kid, gotten them shipped out, uh, taken care of, they've gotten their intubation, they've got their dialysis, which is uh, truly miracle in, its, in itself that that was able to happen. Um, you know, I feel kind of blessed. I'm in a facility like, okay, just send them up. We'll take care of it. Uh, now, if I call them a 15 year old, I think people would lose their mind and somebody may explode. But um, good news is we've got the university hospital just down the street. All right, let's transition to our second case. And, you know, for some reason in my mind, gosh, I kind of, kind of feel like, you know, about the the idea of what we're talking about, about drinking milk and all those things when you're growing up and that need for calcium. So let's see how this goes. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go to it. So here we have a, a two-year-old female who's coming in and she may have drank a little bit of rust remover right before she came in. She had one episode of vomiting and her family brought her immediately to the emergency department. They recognized this could be bad. And, uh, they were telling me, Hey, she was doing great before this happened. Everything was all, everything was all good. She's healthy, vaccinated looking great. When you take a look at this kid, she's got a heart rate of 160. Okay. Uh, you know, for a young kid crying, maybe you can explain that, but maybe something different. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And she's crying, but you notice that she has some mild oropharyngeal um, erythema. Airway is otherwise patented at this point. Again, a little bit of tachycardia, but otherwise lungs sound okay. No other abnormal heart sounds. Abdomen soft. Musk, MSK is looking good. And from a skin standpoint, otherwise, again, not looking too bad. So you're in the middle of doing your assessment. You're looking at, you know, trying to figure out what the product might be. And you ask the family to see if someone else at home can send a picture. And uh, the family was able to get someone to text a picture. And what you find is that it's got 2.3% hydrofluoric acid that's actually contained within that product. So Let's go back to the basics for a minute and really think about what that is, because I can tell you from my standpoint, it makes the, uh, you know, the red flags kind of just start waving in my mind. So what, uh, what do we need to do? So you're going back to the basics and you're thinking, okay, I'm getting IV access on this kid really, really quickly. I'm securing the airway. You know, there's a concern she may have drank some of this hydrofluoric acid and you notice there's some oropharyngeal erythema in the meantime. And even though her airway right now is patent, you're a little bit concerned that it may not be that way for much longer. You're finishing your primary survey and you do notice there's some QTC prolongation on that EKG. So what do I want you as a, uh, an EM or a PEMDOC to remember about hydrofluoric acid? Well, it's bad, far and away, but let's, let, we'll go a little bit deeper there. So when we're thinking about hydrofluoric acid as a whole, overall, it's a weak acid. So you may be thinking, why am I as worried about this if it's a weak acid? Well, it's not just the proton that you're really worried about from the acid standpoint, but it's also its anion when it dissociates, and that's going to be a fluoride anion. 
It really likes to bind to those divalent cations. So those are going to be things in your body that include calcium and magnesium. So when you're thinking about it, you're not going to just have the caustic injury that occurs from the acid. You also have to worry about a bunch of other things, including really, really persistent, nasty, scary cardiac dysrhythmias. So we start to think about this case and what we're going to do. We get some labs and you find the ionized calcium is low. You find the magnesium is low. And you look at the EKG, you find the QRS is 96 milliseconds looking okay. But that QTC is 570. And again, definitely not something that you want to see. And now you're going back to your computer. You're thinking, all right, I got to get these orders in real quick. I'm going to try to call a poison center, get a little bit of help. And one of your, uh, you know, your nurses who's been there for a long time is really experienced, comes up to you and says, hey, there's something uh, weird on the monitor that I'm noticing. I'm sure that's a situation that everyone else has been in here too. And it's definitely not one that uh, any of us envy. So you take a look and you find, this kid had a self-terminating episode of torsades. That's no bueno. So what are we going to do? Well, you're thinking if the uh, the kid is going to be having problems from that fluoride anion binding to all of the calcium and magnesium, we know the calcium and magnesium are low. Let's go ahead and let's try to fix it. So you go ahead and you give some IV calcium, IV magnesium. You're going to keep that kid on continuous cardiac monitoring in the meantime. And you're going to be wanting to check pretty frequent labs and EKGs while keeping this kid on that continuous monitoring because you'll be able to know if that QTC is starting to prolong out again and causing problems, and if the kid's having any more weird episodes of, uh, you know, torsades. So, uh, Ryan, anything you wanted to jump in with before we, uh, you know, kind of get to the conclusion for uh, case number two? Well, I wanted to jump in and say, listen, kiddos, if, if you're young into medicine, especially emergency medicine, you need to know hydrofluoric acid. The rust <laughs> removal will show up on every exam possible. Uh, you'll see it everywhere. And, you know, I don't know if you've, because uh, I, I didn't notice that it was, since this is an ingestion versus a durable exposure. Uh, so far, we're two for two with the mixed presentations. I mean, you, we, you have the mixed acid base presentation with salicylate toxicity. And this is the one uh, that with the dermal exposure has the mixed liquefactive and, coag and uh, coagulopathic necrosis. So it's the one that actually does both of what typically an acid and a base does. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that uh, this is one of the weird ones that does the weird stuff with the uh, with uh, topical exposures as well. So it, it'll do a little bit of both. So when somebody says, uh, unlike the acids, which typically have the coagulative and the bases, which have typically have the liquefactive, this one is one of the weird ones, uh, as you mentioned, with the breaking off that will actually end up doing both um, and where you can get significant systemic changes from even dermal exposures. So, you know, this is definitely one that if you've got tests ahead of you. Uh, this will show back up again, and rust remover at ABIM General is a lot more popular than it is out and about. Uh, I'm not sure that how many people are cleaning their chrome bumpers anymore. Um, back in the day, uh, young folks, the bumpers actually were made of metal, not a collapsible chippy plastic with uh, with sensors because we didn't have airbags. All we had was metal bumpers, steel frames, and your mom's arm to keep you from hitting the dashboard. So. Um, this is, this is one that'll definitely show up in your future. So let's see what happened to this one. Yeah. And, you know, you make a, you make a good point, Ryan, for a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the people out there who are going to be taking their, uh, their boards. Uh, yeah. ABEM general really does like uh, that rust remover. And so, you know, you've got some of the stuff that people keep around the home and keep under their sinks. And you also have a lot of these other products, including things like hydrofluoric acid or ammonium bifluoride, which have a lot of, uh, a lot of fluoride that can cause some pretty significant trouble. And in addition to that, you know, we think to ourselves, well, depending on the concentration and the overall uh, percentage of the body surface area exposed, that's where we really start to get concerned if, you know, with larger exposures or more concentrated versions dermally, you're more likely to have a, you know, a worse outcome from that, right? But I always want to remind people, even a very small amount, if it's ingested, can be life-threatening, even if the percentage or the concentration isn't nearly as high as what you may see from some other dermal exposures. Always take those oral ingestions very, very seriously because it doesn't take a lot to cause really significant toxicity. Completely agree. Completely agree. And in this case, um, how did how did this uh, young person turn out after their experience with trying to take the rust off the bumper of their GI system? Well, you know, fortunately, uh, fortunately, this kiddo ended up doing all right. So uh, you continue treatment with calcium and magnesium. And you do notice the electrolyte derangements are there for maybe about a day or so, but fortunately ends up doing okay. 
Now, because the kid had a, uh, a caustic exposure, uh, GI was involved and they found that the child had a grade 2A injury on endoscopy. And when we're starting to think about what we do with these caustics, for an, a grade 2A, we don't really need to do anything too special in terms of following some, some protocols to try to decrease stricture formation and things like that if we're looking at it from an evidence-based standpoint. So this kid was able to do okay from that end and was excavated about two days later and overall ended up doing pretty well. Fortunately, the amount that the child got into really wasn't all, you know, it wasn't a horribly large volume because otherwise it can get pretty, uh, pretty scary. And I mean, this is scary enough. If uh, the kid got any even more, I'd be uh, even more worried. But fortunately, did well. Overall. And that's, you know, this is a nice little nugget to throw in there at the end with the, you know, thinking about the short term sequela, which is what we address in emergency medicine, but also thinking about that longer term sequela with that potential of a caustic age and esophageal uh, strictures and and things that may cause them lifelong uh, issues and challenges. It's not always about what's just going to happen now. Unfortunately, you know, when we talk to talking to a lot of patients about, you know, COVID and some of the things that that we were seeing, you know, some of it's the short term stuff, some of it's the long term stuff. We need to talk about them both. And this is why we do the things the way that we do them. Um, another common theme that is is transpired through the two talks podcasts that we've done is, you know, the concern about one of the greatest fears I had when I had children, and that is uh, baby proofing your home. And then more importantly, baby proofing family homes. Um, as folks uh, start to uh, age, you know, they tend to lay medications out, you know, early reminders, you know, my idea of reminders is just keeping stuff laid out on the counters. That way I see it and know it. You know, whether it's a pill container, not myself with the pit for them, whatever it is. But, you know, if you've got your grandparents' house, and that's what uh, um, Dr. Cantor was talking about. And he's like, you know, I've got grandkids now and I have to go baby proof my house. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's, how am I going to deal with this? And um, the idea of these exposures, things that may not be a huge deal in adults that may, de- may be potentially fatal in the pediatric population. So let's talk about case number three. And one of those, you know, exposures. It can be very dangerous in pediatrics, completely accidental, and why it's of utmost important as a, as a parent, um, grandparent, whoever, if you have young family members around, especially with these gymnastics toddlers who can get anywhere and everywhere, that the only fair competition in the house is the cat in terms of where they can get, um, that they may get exposed to something that could be very dangerous to them. Yeah, absolutely. I that's why I feel like in emergency medicine or at the poison center, we're always going to have jobs because kids are always going to get into trouble in some capacity. All right, so if we're uh, we're hopping into the third case then, and uh, here we have a uh, four-year-old male who is uh, getting into some trouble. So normally when grandma comes over to visit, she has a lot of candy in her purse and very frequently gives the child, you know, some stuff here and there. So, you know, parents and grandparents are in the other room. Child runs to grab some candy in the meantime while mom's not looking. And unfortunately, instead of grabbing, uh, you know, some uh, some lifesavers, ends up uh, getting into the uh, the little ties and extended release that grandma normally takes. Now, this occurred about two hours ago, and uh, the child's being brought to the emergency department shortly after they realize the problem. Take a look at the kid. You find that, you know, vital signs aren't looking nearly as good as you'd like them to. You find the child's hypotensive uh, and bradycardic. I don't love seeing a heart rate of 72 in a four-year-old. That's not, it's not great. Um, certainly makes me a little bit more concerned, particularly amongst the setting that we have. Child's a little bit somnolent, but is appropriately interactive when you wake them up. HENT is looking okay, and you find they are bradycardic relative for age. Um, not quite to the point you need to start going down your uh, your ACL, or I'm sorry, your pales resuscitation rate yet, but you know, still, uh, still not as far away as you'd like them to be. Lungs otherwise sound okay. Because this kid's holding still, and uh, you remember, you do check the bowel sounds, you find they're a little bit diminished, and uh, great job to you as an EM doc for remembering to do that. Your friendly neighborhood poison specialist will be forever in your debt. Uh, muscles and uh, neuro exam otherwise will look okay, and skin's dry. So what do we do off the bat? Well, this one's right up the alley of a lot of emergency medicine providers because it's not uncommon for us to see hypotensive bradycardic patients, right? So you know what to do from a primary survey. You're running through your ABCDEs. In this case, you recognize the hypotension, you recognize the bradycardia, you remember to get that dextra stick, and you find the glucose is 170. Now, interestingly enough, um, calcium channel blockers actually do, in many cases, cause you to have some relative degree of hyperglycemia. Uh, 
they can interfere with the way that your body releases uh, insulin from your pancreas. And as a result, that uh, glucose may be a little bit high, but at least in this case, the kid being a little altered, didn't have a finger stick of 30. So that was definitely good for you to establish early on. So let's go ahead and start treatment. So you know what to do, hypotension, bradycardia, you're giving some fluids to try to help that pressure. You're giving some atropine to see if that may bump your blood pressure. I'm sorry, your heart rate up a little bit. And as you're getting those things administered to the kid, you have a couple moments to take a step back and really think about what you need to focus on with these calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers in 60 seconds, I'm going to promise I'm going to try to stick to that. So essentially, what do they do? Well, they prevent extracellular calcium influx into the cell. What does that mean? Well, we have calcium channels that exist all over in our body, right? They're both in the central as well as in the peripheral area. When we're thinking central, we're thinking of the heart. And problems with that can cause problems with your overall rate and strength of contraction. And from a peripheral standpoint, you can have problems with your vasculature, and that may cause you to have some hypotension. You can have problems with your GI tract, and as a result, you may have diminished bowel sounds like this kid did. And you can also have diminished insulin release from the pancreas. As a result, you may have some hyperglycemia. And while that hyperglycemia in and of itself isn't going to usually be an issue, um, it does kind of serve as a surrogate marker that, hey, you know. Uh, this kid definitely got into some medication if the hypotension and bradycardia didn't tip you off. So we're jumping on, you know, we, we're, we've got this medicine now that's impacting, of course, um, you know, on grandma and grandpa is not a huge deal uh, with what they're doing is controlling the blood pressure, you know, doing the things it's supposed to do. Now the pediatric patient, now we're attacking several of their uh, major functions with the uh, cardiovascular system, as well as GI and pancreas. Wow, that's a, that's a new one for me. So how do we go about this? And what are we, you'd already mentioned, you know, up top, some of the fluids and the atropine, some of the basic type early stuff to do. Uh, let's jump into some of these things that we're going to need to do. Uh, I think as you put them as, as remembering the buckets here of, uh, of ways that we can approach this. And it's going to be the second mention of this one therapy that's 100%, because the last case last week was a beta blocker. This one's going to be calcium channel. So stay tuned. You're going to hear it two podcasts in a row. Go for it. All right. Well, hey, um, in this case here, I, I do have to give a shout out to one of my uh, my former attendings and uh, colleagues, Dr. Eggleston, because he loves his buckets. I love to make fun of him for the buckets, but I also like to use the buckets. So that being said, let's talk about buckets. I'll see how many times I can say that word. But uh, we're thinking about bucket number one. That's going to be what most people are reaching for on a day-to-day -day basis for a hypotense bradycardic patient. Um, you know, the fluids, the atropine, those are things that are like second nature to emergency medicine providers. And with a calcium channel blocker, you're thinking, okay, maybe I should give some calcium. It might help. Usually calcium, if given appropriately, is a relatively benign treatment for most patients. I think it's definitely worth a shot in these cases. Now, unfortunately, despite your best efforts, things from bucket one aren't always going to work. And in the case with this kid who's looking a little bit sicker right off the bat, you're probably going to need to move to that bucket number two. That one's going to house our vasopressors and our high-dose insulin buglycemic therapy. Now, for those of you who work primarily with the adult population, what you're, I, I feel like my experience is that most people like to reach for norepinephrine as their vasopressor of choice right off the bat. Most people are pretty comfortable with it and don't use epinephrine as a vasopressor quite as much. But for those who are PGM trained, particularly from the pediatric pathway, a lot of them will reach for epinephrine as their presser of choice. I'll be honest with you as a, you know, as a toxicologist with a background in PZM, I, I don't really care. A, a direct acting vasopressor like norepi or epi is a direct acting vasopressor. And that's really what I want to go for. You know, your epi is probably going to have a little bit more beta than alpha effect. Your norepi has maybe a little bit more alpha than beta, but if you get to a high enough dose, you probably overwhelm that selectivity anyway. So pick what you are familiar with, what is readily available in your department. I'd much rather have this kid, you know, start on a norepi infusion. Um, earlier on, you know, in a couple minutes, then having to wait 45 minutes for pharmacy to make it up and get it to the bedside. So use what's available. And, uh, you know, we can always help you with that too, from the poison center standpoint, if you're not sure. But the other thing that people aren't as familiar with is that high dose insulin euglycemic therapy. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So we'll put a pin in that. But if these two aren't working, then the other thing is that you can reach for in your third bucket are things like uh, methylene blue, uh, hydroxycobalamin. You want to consider ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. 
And if you don't have that available and the kid's really sick and crashing, maybe think about some fat emulsion therapy. That might be something helpful. But again, um, just to stay true to what uh, you know, Ryan kind of alluded to before, we're going to mention that HIET therapy. So what is it? Many of you may have used it in adults. A lot of people in pediatrics haven't used it nearly as often. But like I mentioned, it's that high-dose insulin euglycemic therapy. So what does that look like? Well, typically, it's one unit per kilo as a bolus of insulin. That's right, one unit per kilo. For those of us who take care of adults on a regular basis, that is almost a tenfold increase of what we normally start someone on for something like DKA, something we see pretty, uh, pretty routinely. The doses of insulin you can get up to are extremely high to the point most providers, if they haven't done this before, get really uncomfortable. So after that bolus is given, we go to one unit per kilo per hour, and sometimes we titrate up. There are cases that are reported of going up to, you know, not infrequently, 10 units per kilo per hour of insulin, which is a lot of insulin. So it's important to remember that with this high-dose insulin euglycemia, it takes time to work. Unlike your vasopressors, where you can titrate them pretty rapidly, within a matter of minutes, you're going to see an effect and you can titrate accordingly. This takes time. It may take about 30 minutes to start seeing an effect and maybe up to 60 to see that peak effect. So recognizing that starting those pressors while simultaneously starting your insulin are things that should go hand in hand. If I have a sick calcium channel blocker, beta blocker patient, and I'm reaching for the vasopressors, I normally reach for the HIET at the same time. It's going to be important for you to make sure you're watching the glucose. There's a reason we say euglycemia with it, because you want to try to prevent them from getting hypoglycemic. Now, the nice thing is that generally, once you start to get really high doses of insulin, at least anecdotally from my experience, I haven't found it nearly as hard to control someone's glucose when I go from four units per kilo per hour up to 10 units per kilo per hour compared to when I'm changing them from, you know, nothing to two units per kilo per hour. That relative adjustment seems like you kind of saturate those insulin receptors. So it might not be as hard to control that glucose as you think. And as we all know from treating hyperkalemic patients uh, routinely in the ED, using something like insulin shifts potassium intracellularly. So remembering you want to watch that potassium too to prevent them from having you know, significant toxicity from profound hypokalemia can be really important. Are you having to do any uh, baseline glucose replacement with this? And is there a uh, particular dosing that you're going to do in comparison, or is it uh, simply off the numbers that you're getting off your dextro sticks? Because that may, I may order it every hour, but I may get it every four. Yeah, you know, so that's a great question, Ryan. And depending on where you are in the country, your local poison centers usually have some protocols or something to try to help you, you know, kind of guide this. Um, I'll tell you, in all honesty, controlling a patient who is a, a calcium channel blocker from a glucose standpoint is usually easier than a beta blocker because you already have that calcium channel blocker blocking some of the endogenous insulin release. So it oftentimes is a little bit easier to control them. And frequently what I'll see in someone who is a calcium channel blocker toxicity is in a way, once they, you know, they're stable with their sugars initially with the supplemental dextrose I'm giving, once they start needing more, that's almost their body's way of telling me, hey, now we're metabolizing out more drug because the insulin is starting to be released from the pancreas again. So to kind of give a, a short answer to your question, um, I routinely will start people on dextrose initially as well. Now you do sometimes get into trouble with fluids. And so this really will depend on where you're at for the amount of fluid you're giving. But that actually leads really nicely into the, uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up, which is what to do with the insulin concentration. Normally, when we think about insulin, I can tell you before I started toxicology, I didn't routinely think of this as a bedside provider, but the amount of insulin in terms of its concentration is usually one unit per ml. So you can imagine if you're getting one unit per ml and you're dealing with a smaller child, okay, you're probably not going to go way over on your fluids. But if you go up to that 10 units per ml, it's really easy to get far above what their normal you know, maintenance rate of fluid might be and get them into a fluid overloaded state. So you as a provider can go to, the, uh, you know, to your pharmacy and say, hey, can you concentrate this down? Because the pharmacy can actually concentrate insulin from one unit per ml to 10 units per ml. And that really decreases the amount of fluid you're giving this kid by a factor of 10. That can be huge, especially if you're needing to give them other therapies, including things like dextrose, uh, including other you know, vasopressors and other agents. So that's a really important thing to remember. So just make sure you keep that kind of locked in the back of your mind. And like I mentioned, it really does help decrease that fluid overload that you can see with these cases too. So um, you know, in this case here, fortunately, the child um, 
ended up doing pretty well. Unfortunately, minimally responsive to the fluids, the atropine and the calcium, maybe a little bit of an improvement with that epi drip. So you started them on the HIET simultaneously, titrated up to four units per kilo per hour. Eventually, the child's blood pressure, heart rate stabilized to a point you were comfortable. At that point, you come down on the vasopressor. Honestly, I like to try to take the vasopressors off before the HIET. You know, again, the literature kind of, in my opinion, suggests that the earlier you can get the pressors off, the more likely the patient is to have a better outcome. Uh, but not to say you should rush it. If it's a sick patient and took a while to control, you've got time. But when I start to down titrate, I go pressors first because if they start to worsen again, I just turn them right back up and no harm, no foul. So once the uh, patient was or titrated off pressors, we titrate down the HIAT. Took a few days, but this kid ended up doing very well overall and Fortune didn't have a bad outcome. But again, it just highlights kind of what Ryan mentioned earlier on about making sure you're childproofing not just your home, but you know family members' homes and keeping things locked up so that kids can't get into them. Things like calcium channel blockers, including diltiazem, fall into that pediatric one pill kill list for me. So I always get really, really worried if a child has even one pill that they ingest of something like this, because as we have, or as we demonstrated in this case, you can get really sick from even just one. So we've had, you know, we, this is the HIET, that is that is the thing that was mentioned, even though you did throw in the methylene blue in there as well, which is one of the port talk, uh, talks we had with the methemoglobinemia uh, last week. Um, so with this, um, the kid does overall well, um, recovers, um, you know, sounds like something for sure going to be close, close monitoring because the amount of uh, medications are going to be involved with the hemodynamic status of getting this child to an appropriate uh, pediatric intensive monitoring set uh, setting. Uh, so uh, again, uh, once you start getting these things going, in the symptomatic children starting to initiate those transfer uh, processes. Because I remember not too long ago. Now, of course, now with, with uh, being spring, it's not as much, uh, fortunately, right now. But, you know, last year we had that point where all the viruses decided to come back at the same time. And we had this huge influx and spike in pediatric admissions. And we were, you know, even, even for us with two great uh, pediatric facilities within an hour, um, we ended up potentially transferring people out of the state. Uh, because of that. So keep that in mind that, again, just like everything else, start to initiate that process sooner than later uh, with these uh, pediatric patients. Because even if you stabilize them and everything goes well, it's getting them transferred is going to be a challenge and having the right crew that can transition this type of patient. So you're talking about likely ending up with uh, some sort of critical care transport, pediatric specialized transport like we have locally, or even an air transport. Uh, because uh, many ground-based crews will not be able or willing to do this level of uh, medication transport. Um, so we've got time for one more case, and you had one more case in here. So let's uh, let's chat about uh, this one. Starts off bad uh, from the very the very beginning. So uh, let's talk about case number four, and then we'll uh, put a bow on this thing. Listen. And, you know, I got to tell you, if you're, uh, if you're a provider who's getting, you know, these four cases that are coming at you one after another in a shift, uh, it may be, uh, may, may be a pretty rough, pretty rough day, but uh, you'll be happy when you go to your next one and you don't have all these bad ones coming at you. So uh, in this case here, we have a five-year-old female who's coming in and uh, she initially ate some medication from the medicine cabinet and EMS was called immediately after the family saw this. When uh, EMS got to the scene, they found the child was in full arrest, and so they started CPR and uh, were continuing high-quality compressions, got her to you really, really quickly. So you're, the child's being wheeled into your trauma bay, and you're immediately continuing that PELS protocol for resuscitation, high-quality compressions, you're getting a line, you're getting the child intubated, and in the meantime, you know, continuing that workup, family arrives just behind the EMS providers, and uh, they come in with a bottle. So what is the culprit in this case? Well, there aren't a lot of things that drop a kid really that quickly, but one of them is going to be benzonidate. So I know that a lot of times this is medication that can be very commonly prescribed for cough. And again, before going into toxicology, I didn't fully recognize just how potentially dangerous this medication is. So a lot of EM docs, a lot of family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrician doctors, pretty much anyone that is doing outpatient medicine who deals with people who are coming in who aren't feeling great, coughs are really tough. There aren't a lot of things that control them necessarily well. 
And sometimes we try our best to do something to help people feel a little better. And benzonitate or Teslon pearls, as they are sometimes commonly known, are things that are commonly prescribed. But why is this a problem so much for a child? Well, in some cases, it looks like candy. And that's certainly something you worry about um, because a child is going to be more likely to go ahead and try to get into that. And in addition to that, these are some of those pills that fall on the one pill kill list. And you can get almost local stat or local anesthetic like effects from these medications. And they can include things like seizures and cardiovascular collapse. So certainly things that are really, really worrisome. Well, what can you do? So you're continuing your normal ACE or your normal pills protocol and really, you know, trying to optimize that child's outcome from that end. But in tox, we like to have antidotes if we can. And this one actually has an antidote that we think probably works really well. And this is going to be that lipid emulsion therapy. Now, what is it? Well, it's essentially a 20% lipid emulsion solution that you give. And the dosing is, uh, you know, relatively straightforward initially, and then you can kind of discuss what to do after that. But in general, usually most people will do 1.5 mLs per kilo as a bolus and oftentimes continue it as an infusion for a little while afterwards. When we're thinking about it, I mean, you'll hear people throw about lipid emulsion therapy and toxicology for a coding patient, not infrequently, um, especially several years ago, it seemed like it was a little bit more of a hot topic. There's been some more literature out there to say well, it may not work well for a lot of things, but there is really strong data for local anesthetics in terms of their toxicity and giving this lipid emulsion. Essentially, it provides that fat sink, and it really goes ahead and takes something that's lipophilic, and like a lot of the local anesthetics are, sequesters them and prevents them from, or kind of pulls them off the binding site, and people can get better really quickly. Again, it can be used for some other substances, particularly in the pericode setting where you don't have anything else to really throw at the patient. And oftentimes if you hear us say, you know, it's a Hail Mary attempt in the tox world, this is often what we're referring to. But for a local anesthetic, this is something I'm definitely reaching for in a, in a sick case. So for this kiddo, uh, you know, you were successfully able to administer that lipid emulsion therapy. The resuscitation was successful. The kid was intubated for about a day was able to walk out of the hospital a few days later um, and fortunately ended up doing very well from a neurologic perspective simply because the EMS team did such a phenomenal job identifying uh, you know, the critical nature, starting that high-quality compression, and uh, you know, got the kid to the hospital really quickly where that high-quality resuscitation was continued. So certainly one of those ones that really scares me a lot, and I want all the providers to just take away, if you are going to prescribe Tesla and Pearls for family members or for patients, Please, please, please remind them just how deadly and life-threatening they can be for little kids. It's always something I want people to be aware of so they know to keep these things up out of sight, out of reach, locked away, all those magical things. That's fantastic uh, information. And, you know, with that, for us, lipid emulsion, you know, for folks that have a protocol on um, on uh, regional anesthesia, uh, doing like femoral nerve blocks or whatever, a lot of protocols will have that uh, lipid emulsion at the bedside, just in case you just decide to unbeknowingly uh, drop 30 uh, mLs of a 0.25 bupivacaine into a vessel and see what happens after that. Um, so, you know, we do have those available. That's where a lot of people now are, are seeing these lipid emulsions, but I've seen them used in overdoses before. The prior hospital I worked at had a fair amount of overdoses and using the lipid emulsions uh, for some of those as well. So chatting with uh, Dr. Vince Kaleo and, and, you know, we've got us uh, a fantastic group of pediatric uh, talks, two weeks of talks um, and some stuff that'll make you a little bit nervous and uh, things that will give you some tools and things that you can use in your emergency department. And interestingly, uh, with these two weeks of conversations, I've actually had one or two of these patients um, within my recent stretch of shifts. And so it is not terribly unusual. Maybe the age population may be a little bit uh, different, but you know, with pediatrics, you know, understanding and, and the idea that, you know, a lot of stuff looks like looks like candy. Um, and, you know, if it's laying around the way kids experiment, just like a puppy dog, uh, they put it in their mouth and they eat it. And so, you know, unfortunately, with many of these things, it's the potential of a high risk of, of exposure with very small amounts of something. So uh, let's get a let's put a wrap up on it. Any take home message uh, messages as we've now had to talk specialist back to back uh, for the ASAP Frontline podcast. Uh, any take home messages or any closing thoughts that you may have as we wrap up the podcast today? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I think the biggest thing I want people to take away and remember is that when you're treating a coding pediatric patient and you think it's from a toxicologic cause, don't lose your head and you know start to uh, you know unravel because of that. The most important things you can do are really starting and optimizing the overall resuscitation that you would do for every single case that comes to the ED that's unstable in a pericode or in a code setting. Remember with Toxo, there may be some specific things you can do to really help you know optimize the outcome in addition to what you're already doing. So make sure that you uh, you know that you're focusing on the main resuscitation initially while you're thinking about the other things. I mean, there are a lot of things from a tox perspective that can really cause some significant life-threatening toxicity. And some of those ones are ones that we talked about today. Those are going to include things like bad salicylate poisonings. And one of the things I want people to take away from that and remember is that in addition to the normal salicylate management you're going to do, including your bicarb, your dialysis if needed, is remember that if a patient needs to be intubated, be really, really careful about how you do that intubation and optimize those outcomes because sometimes they do need intubation and doing that the right way can help to significantly increase the likelihood of them having a, a positive outcome there. When we think about some other stuff, we think about you know those really life-threatening cases from things like hydrofluoric acid. We may not always think about giving things like calcium and magnesium right off the bat to a coding patient, but if you know it's from a hydrofluoric acid, maybe think about it because it might be part of the reason they're having their horrible cardiac dysrhythmias is because the calcium and the magnesium in their bodies being absorbed by that fluoride anion. Thinking about those bad calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, remember that in addition to the normal resuscitative efforts you're going to do for a hypotensive bradycardic patient, thinking about high dose insulin euglycemic therapy is a relatively unique therapy for those, uh, you know, for those poisons to really help to improve the overall cardiac output and the patient's blood pressure, et cetera. And uh, finally, just wrapping up with that last case we had, thinking about those local anesthetic poisonings in and of themselves, using things like lipid emulsion or fat emulsion therapy can really be helpful because it can bind those local anesthetics and help to really improve the overall outcome of the patient. Now, like we talked about, kids are going to get into things because kids get into things. I always remind folks that some little things that you can remind family members of is a lot that or a lot of stuff that we sometimes just take for granted, which is reminding families to keep things out of sight, out of reach, locked up, out of sight, out of mind. I, those are huge things that, you know, kids don't see something, they may forget it's there. Um, you know, maybe telling families, hey, you know, fortunately the kid's doing great today, but think about a medication lockbox that might decrease the likelihood that they'll get into something in the future. And most importantly, if they ever have, remind families if they ever have any questions, they can always call us at the poison center. Regardless of where you are in the country, for any of the listeners, whether you're in upstate New York or anywhere in the country, you have a poison center that's available to you 24-7, 365, with people that are highly trained and more than willing to help you with any questions or any cases that you have, not just from the hospital, but reminding families of that, maybe a way to even decrease the overall visits because a child may take an extra couple Tylenol at home by accident. And as a result, the family may rush them into the ED. You can remind them, hey, call the poison center. You might be able to stay home or you might need to come in. So just remember, uh, if you ever have any questions, you know, feel free to call your local poison center or your local toxicology group. And we're always more than happy to help in any way that we can. And that number is going to be the same no matter where you are. Uh, across the country, 1-800-222-1222. Um, and, you know, used to growing up when you had your landline phones, I was always on the, a sticker on the back of the landline phones. I've had them on the hospitals too, but 1-800-222-1222. And in fact, last week I texted a partner of mine from the emergency department, asked for somebody else's phone number, and he actually sent me the poison center phone number. It reminded me back in the day when we wore pagers and we'd page folks to the OR. In the OR, we'd page them to inappropriate numbers because they would call uh, from the OR on speaker phone. So uh, this is a very appropriate number. And so making sure that you know it. And encourage, you know, if you have these toxicities, especially polypharmacy, to give them a call. There's fantastic information. It really is impressive with a lot of the chemicals and, and the uh, things that are exposed in the environment. So not a medication, um, the chemicals that they see. And, and you know, may have a certain product uh, that, you know, some of those gas station based things or whatever. And they say, oh, this is what it is. This is what you need to do. This is how long you need to do it for us. If you're going to watch So it is. It really is impressive, especially if it's something that's outside your wheelhouse in terms of common medications. 
Uh, the take home message from a couple of these is make sure you know up front uh, if you are staff in emergency department at the position that you're working with is the director of the poison center because apparently that's a common theme is to ask about calling police poison control and the person who's over it's right there in the room with you so you may want to dig in and know about your doctors uh, to make sure i'm not that so feel free to help me with calling the uh, poison center how can folks get in touch with you speaking of uh, directors of appointments and center. How can folks get in touch with you if they have any uh, questions, comments, or thoughts? Yeah, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions on anything regarding the presentation or really anything in general, I can answer for you. Um, feel free to email me anytime. Uh, my email is going to be c a l l e o v at upstate.edu, and I'm always more than happy to uh, you know field any questions that I can. I'm Dr. Vincent Kaleo and appreciate the time. And again, this is our first experience and experiment with, uh, and it helped that um, uh, Dr. Kaleo just happened to have done a TV interview uh, before. So he was all nice and drop, uh, dressed up. I'm sitting here in my Kentucky t-shirt. Uh, so I did not, uh, but appreciate uh, him willing to allow us to have him on camera for that. If you're listening to the audio podcast, you want to see some of these slides and some of the progression, check out our uh, YouTube page. We will add a link to the show notes to make sure that you have access to that, that you can see the actual video part of it as well. See if my voice matches my face, see if Vince's matches his face. And um, we can all roll from there. As for me, you can contact me at rstandatasep.org, rstandatasep.org, and at Everyday Med on Twitter. I encourage you to subscribe not only to the YouTube feed, because we're going to be putting a lot of stuff there, not just podcasts, but a lot of information, as well as whatever your favorite podcast player is to make sure that you get every weekly episode of the podcast. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.